Good morning. All right, good morning. Go ahead and make your way in. Find a seat. Really glad to have you with us today. And if you didn't uh, grab a bulletin on your way in, you can still probably go out and grab one of those. And if you're new with us this morning, just a special welcome to you. Really glad that you are here to join us this morning to worship God. And uh, if we didn't have an opportunity to give you a little welcome packet, make sure you stop by one of our greeters out front or this little welcome table is just right out the doors and to the left. We've got a little packet, just tells you a little bit about our church, what we believe, who we are, and it gives you some information if you're interested in different ministries or, you know, kind of different things you can get involved with. So make sure you grab one of those little welcome packets on your way out. Well, uh, a few announcements I want to go over. So if you have your bulletins, open it up to that announcement page, that very last page where it says announcements. Um, and I, I trust that you can read through all of them, but uh, a few that I'd like to highlight. First of all, right after church today, we are taking pictures for our picture directory. And so if you've already had your picture taken and maybe you didn't like it or you want an updated one, today's the day. And if you've never had your picture taken, then today is the day. Come over right over here, right after church, kind of get in line real quickly. Virginia is going to be taking pictures of the families and just we'll put it in the picture directory. Those directories are very helpful when uh, trying to meet new people and get to know people. So having those pictures is, is really important. So I encourage you to come on over and get your picture taken today. Well, another announcement that I have is uh, for our Mission Guatemala. And today, um, I just want a, a little bit of an extended announcement to say that uh, the deadline for signing up for Guatemala is the 31st of January, so here in about a week or so. And uh, you can pick up one of these packets, and I'd encourage you, if you felt at all a kind of a tinge or like a, a leaning or, a, oh, maybe I'm interested, go pick up a packet and find out more information about it. And uh, just do some serious prayer. So this is my request of you this week, is as a church, can we be praying about this missions trip? Because, you know, there, there are people in Guatemala right now who we can maybe have the opportunity to go and share the gospel with who have never heard about Jesus Christ. There's people that, that they need to hear about his love and they need to experience it in a real way. And we, here in Nebraska, have an opportunity to go bring that message to them. And so, uh, would you consider and at least pray about it this week? And pray for others this week that we would be able to form a team and that God would bring just the right people together for our team to go to Guatemala and make a difference for his kingdom. And so uh, I'd encourage you to go pick up one of these red packets in the back. If you have any questions at all, come talk to me. There's lots of flexibility um, with different things. And so if you have a concern or, or just a question, give me a call, send me an email. I'd love to be able to talk to you about it. We need those uh, applications need to be turned in by the 31st because I need to have a team formalized uh, with enough people. Otherwise, we might not be able to make the trip happen. So that's my uh, last kind of announcement for Mission Guatemala. Uh, all right, well, I think that's enough announcements. The rest I think you, you can read through. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of different things to sign up for. So I encourage you to look at that. All right, well, let's get started this morning. If you are able this morning, would you please stand with me now? Let's listen to God's word for us and let it uh, prepare our hearts and our minds to worship him this morning. This comes from Psalm chapter 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. the king sing to the king who is coming to reign glory to jesus the lamb that was slain life and salvation 
nation his empire shall bring. Enjoy to the nations when Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. He's the King. For His return. For His returning, we watch and we pray. Satan is vanquished and Jesus is King. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised. Jesus, sing to the King. Let's repeat that. Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise. Sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King. He's our Lord. He's our Lord. He's our King. Of Him we shout. Of Him we sing. He's the one from on high. Our saving grace. Jesus Christ. All hail the power of Jesus' name. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. The chosen seed of Israel's race He ransomed from the fall Hail Him who saves us by His grace And crown Him Lord of all Hail Him who saves us by His grace And crown Jesus Christ. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him. 
Jesus Christ. You know what? Josh told us, uh, asked us to pray for those who are considering going to Guatemala. Let's pray right now um, for those in Guatemala. Father, we ask that you would make the nations glad. Make them oh so happy. There are many out there in distress and in sadness and in utter darkness that need you. Father, as we just sang, we get to join the everlasting song when Jesus returns, and we are stoked for that day. But there are so many that do not have that hope. So we pray for those in Guatemala that we long to reach out to, that you would be doing that work of tilling the soil and, and preparing hearts to receive your word, so that some would join in this glorious song that we sing, expecting, with hopeful expectation of the day your son will return. Lord, please prepare laborers from this church to go into the harvest and to plant your word, to proclaim that Jesus has come, to proclaim that a kingdom is at hand and that this kingdom's ruler has conquered death. Father, please help us to be a church that is thinking to the farthest reaches of this earth, that we are not thinking merely here at home, but we are thinking of everyone uh, who is lost in this world in darkness that does not drink of life that we have in your name. So we, we pray again, Lord, make your word come true and make the nations glad. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning again. Um, if you're new here, inside uh, the bulletin that you were given when you walked in, we have uh, this insert that looks just like this. This is our monthly memory passage, another resource that we provide uh, so that we as a church can ensure that we're in the Word and that we are memorizing the Word and hiding the Word in our heart. Um, this month, this is the last week for this memory passage. So if you haven't memorized it yet, get hot, as we say in the Navy. Um, but it comes from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. And if ever there was a passage to get you inspired to reading and memorizing the Word of God, it would be this particular passage. So let's read this together now. Hebrews 4, 12 through 16. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates into the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and to judging the thoughts, thoughts and intentions of the heart. heart. And no creature, no creature is, is hidden from his sight, sight but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. If you're able, would you stand again? We're going to sing one more song. So if you could stand, please. Um, this song is called, My Worth is Not in What I Own. You may, have, you may remember Virginia and, and John and some of the other folks singing this uh, while I was away. And this is an awesome song that we need to learn as a group. So if you're good at learning songs, sing along with us. If not, still participate wondering at this great work of Jesus and the value you have because of his work. Not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name. 
shame. But in the blood of Christ that flowed at the cross, I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. Trust in him, no other. My soul is satisfied in him alone. As summer flowers, as summer flowers, we fade and die. Fame, youth, and beauty hurry by. But life eternal calls to us. The cross. I will not boast in wealth or mind, or human wisdom fleeting by, but I will boast in knowing Christ. in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. Two wonders here that I confess. My worth and my unworthiness, my value fixed, my ransom paid at the cross. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. Trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. I rejoice in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him alone. And God says to us, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. You may be seated. There's nothing to see. Look away. <laughs> You're going to have to fix that, Bobby. I'm sorry. <laughs> Trying to take a shortcut. Well, hopefully I haven't distracted us too much. I want to lead us in prayer. Um, as, uh, as we do that, if, I'll, if I could just draw your attention, especially if you're new with us this morning, we provide you with uh, an insert, uh, and that's, that's the one we worked from for the memory verse. Uh, but it's also an opportunity, if you keep it in your Bible, it's an opportunity for you to be reminded of the things that we need to be in prayer regarding. And so, keep this on hand, tuck it in your Bible, and when you take that time each day to uh, read the Word of God and, and to be in prayer, uh, remember some of these things. And in particular, there are uh, highlighted here occasionally, and more often than not, but uh, some very specific needs of people in our fellowship. And... Uh, and so we need to be uplifting one another in prayer. And so that's a resource for you. Uh, let's pray together. As we just sang, Father, what we are rejoicing is in is our Redeemer, the greatest treasure. And, uh, 
And God, we come before you not as being worthy in and of ourselves, but having a worth that is not our own, a righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. And we know that we have been given that because we have faith in the Lord Jesus. We have trusted him. We've trusted in your promises, Father. And in as much as we've trusted what you've said, you've, you've responded to that faith and trust, which is ultimately a gift from you in the first place. But you've credited righteous, righteousness to our accounts. And, uh, and Father, that's a glorious thing. That we come to you not because we earned our place in your presence, but because that way has been made, opened up for us by your son. This new and living way. And we come to you to seek uh, grace and mercy in our time of need. And as a church, we need you, Father. Of course, we exist because of you and for your name and for the name of Jesus, your son. And because of the power of the spirit, that's our existence, Father. But we regard what we do going forward every much uh, dependent upon you. And so we pray that you would empower us as a church for what glorifies you. God, that you would use us as Overland Hills Church to, to make your name famous, not only in this community, but around the world. And Father, in, in accomplishing what you've called us to do, that, that task, as the Lord Jesus told us, of making disciples, proclaiming this gospel to one another and to, to this community, we ask for e effectiveness in that. For apart from your power, apart from your guidance, we would be wasting our time. And what we would do would amount to nothing of eternal value. And so we recognize our utter dependence upon you, Father. And we pray that you would empower all of our ministries. We praise you for the amazing way that you have intervened in our lives to this point. Of course, your mercies are fresh to us every day. They never come to an end because you've called us and set us apart as your people. That is an act of mercy, God, and, and we will be eternally grateful for that. The very breath that we take next, the next time our hearts beat, these are gifts from you. And even if we had none of those, we could still say, you have been gracious to us and merciful to us to call us your own. Even if you take our lives out from us this very second, God, we would stand before you and say, thank you, because you've been good to us to call us your own. We know for the unrighteous, Father, they are far from you and... This life is the best that they can know. This is the best that they can hope for if they're destined for a, a Christless eternity. And we, we long as a church to reach as many as you have determined to save, Father, that you would use us indeed to bring the gospel to them. So strengthen, we pray, our witness uh, at work and in the communities where we live. God, would you give us opportunities to tell of your goodness? Would you, Father, as we encounter those who are as yet unbelieving, would you give us... Um, Lips that would be eager to declare your goodness and your praises. Father, that we may be effective witnesses for you. Lord, as we, uh, we re regard the fact that you've drawn us together uh, in this body. Lord, we, we depend on one another as, the, as you have distributed the various gifts of the spirit among us. We have this interdependence to not only do ministry together. But Father, we care for one another. And your word tells us that. We are to bear one another's burdens and, and we want to do that. We know the greatest thing that we can do is pray for one another. So Father, we, we want to remember before you our sister Kathy as she's battling cancer. We pray for, um, well, as always, Father, we pray for healing. You could take that away from her in a second. Just a word, Father. Um, we know that. We know you have that power. But the fact is, um, to this point, you have not. We pray for an extraordinary measure of grace in Kathy's life to endure the chemo. But Father, the great longing of her heart is her son would come to know you and we pray for that with her. Be merciful to Michael. Father, we pray as well for the rest of us who have unbelieving family and friends that you would use us to bring the gospel to them, that they would turn in repentance and faith to the Lord Jesus. God is rejoicing in heaven when that happens and, and we want to share in that, Lord, here. Would you give us that, that privilege of, of seeing many turn to you in faith? Father, um, among us, there are those who are missing loved ones who are away because they're deployed. And so we pray for those. Pray for Josh in England and Trey in Germany. We pray as well for those among us who serve in the, uh, in the local police forces. And pray for all of them, Father, that you would keep them safe. In particular, where, where there is much tension and much blaming of the police. Um, un injustice or perceived injustice begets violence. And, and that has no place in the society. And yet... Sinful people do per 
propagate this. And, and God, we pray that you would bring calm. We pray for our, our leaders in this nation, Lord, that they would turn to you. God, there is uh, so much godlessness that gets enshrined in law. And the things that happen, uh, we seem powerless. But God, you're not powerless to change the hearts of legislators. And we pray that you would do that. But Lord, more than that, we, we long for that day when Christ will return. And we know that fixing this nation and making it more righteous in the short term isn't going to accomplish your purposes. God, we know that you uh, raise up presidents and kings and congress people and mayors. And you do all of that, God. You're in charge of that. And so we pray for them. And we pray for your will to be done on earth, just as it is in heaven. And, and that you would cause your kingdom to come. Lord, we... Um, recognize your work in other places in this city and other church fellowships. And so we, we ask for a beautiful Savior Lutheran Church. We ask for those uh, in leadership there that they would be truly dedicated to edifying believers, the proclaiming the gospel, that they would do that without apology. God, that you would increase their gospel witness. Keep them firm on the truth of your word. Help them never to waver. Father, we are privileged to be part of a district, a, a collection of churches who are like-minded, uh, together in mission, and, and we have in our district the heartland of Converge. Uh, we have new leadership, and we pray, for, we pray for them. We pray in particular for Jim Capaldo, ask as he transitions into this role away from local church ministry into district ministry, God, that you would give him success in that task. And Father, for the district, the, there's a challenge financially, and we pray that you would meet all of the needs through the churches that have pledged to uh, provide support to the district. And so we pray, not just because there's a man with a job, but because the mission that we have together is, is church health and church planting. And we know that your gospel will reach more places as more churches are planted. So we pray for success. And we ask that you would bless um, Jim and his family, bless our district, bless, bless Converge Worldwide, the Baptist General Conference. We pray that you'd use us to proclaim Christ, not only in this nation, but around the world. Father, we have to acknowledge the great abundance that we have. And we're going to receive an offering, God. We're going to put some money in a plate. Or perhaps we've done that through our bank accounts. But however it has happened, Father, we, we know that we're doing this not because we are paying you back for something. So as we give now, Father, remind us that you owned it already. And that as we set aside this portion, this tenth which seems like a startlingly large amount to many. But God, it belongs to you in the first place. You ask us to do this. We pray, help us be faithful. Faithful stewards of all that you've entrusted to us. Not only in how we give, but how we use the rest of what we hold on to. That we would glorify you with that as well. That we would not be self-indulgent and, and self-seeking. But God, that in all the duties that you've put before us, that we would uh, delightedly spend your resources on what brings you glory. So as this offering is received this morning, Father, we pray that that would be a reminder to us of your goodness, of your provision for the jobs that we have and the ability to earn. All of it has come from your gracious hand upon us. We, we are owed none of it. You can take it away in a moment. We acknowledge that, Father. It belongs to you. We belong to you. Be glorified in this time. We pray it through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.
All right. Well, if I could get all the uh, children to come on up, preschool through third grade, we'll have our quick little children's moment, and they'll head out to church for kids. And if you're new with us, your children are more than welcome to stay with you throughout the service. We're fine with that. But we just kind of want to give you an option if you want to send them out to uh, kind of age-appropriate lessons, learning the, through the same curriculum we do in Sunday school and the curriculum that you do at home. We've got the books. If you guys want to follow along with all these lessons, all we're trying to do here at church is introduce the topic, and then you guys get to re really get into it and get deep when you get home and, and go through the devotionals. Well, we've got a big group this morning. Good morning, everybody. I really just have one question and then like one lesson for us today. Who here has ever told a lie? You guys know what lying is, right? And you've got to raise your hand, otherwise you'd be guilty right now. So who here has ever told a lie? There's a story in the Bible that teaches us a very important lesson. God kills liars. He does. But you know what? He kills other people for other sins too. Because the Bible teaches us that there's a very serious punishment for all of sin. Whether it's lying, stealing, cheating, murder, all those things. You know what the penalty is? It's death. It's very serious, isn't it? Yes, it is. But the Bible has good news. The good news is that Jesus died in our place. So if, if we've been guilty of lying, God says that the, the punishment for that is death. And there's a story about Ananias and Sapphira, two people that lied to God and to other people, and they died right then and there. Now we might tell, tell a lie and not die today or tomorrow, but we'll eventually die. All of us will eventually die. But the good news is that Jesus died in our place. And he died our eternal kind of death, the separation from God, so that we can be forgiven of our lies, we can be forgiven of our sins, and we can go be with him forever and ever and live a true life with him. So it's kind of a sad story today when we go learn about Ananias and Sapphira. It's kind of scary to think that God could just cause you to fall down dead. But you know what? We put our hope and our trust in that it, he has caught, given us a Savior in Jesus Christ. So even though the punishment is very serious for our sin, we know that God still loves us so much that he would take that punishment for us. So let's go learn a little bit more about Ananias and Sapphira and God's love for us. Uh, an email, an email went out to the church family yesterday, and I, I neglected to to remember this in prayer. But Brenda Falk was uh, had recent surgery, and there was some complications. So I just want to take a moment and pray for Brenda. Father, you know um, your dear child Brenda is in your hands, and she loves you. And we pray, Father, that you would restore her body, that you would bring her full health. Not entirely sure what is happening with her, but God, that you would be gracious to her and sustain her in this time. So be near her and um, keep it on our minds to remember her before you, Father, that you may be glorified in what you do accomplish in her life. And we pray through Jesus. Amen. Well, it's good to see you out this morning. I, I, I wonder, and I think this is probably true, a number of you have come through, are still dealing with this nasty virus that's made its way around. All week I battled the lethargy that comes from it. I had no energy. So I'm, I'm sure some of you, you um, identify with that. And how, how great timing right before starting a new uh, preaching series. So uh, I struggled <laughs> this week just to, to, just to get focus. Um, well, that's sounding like an excuse. But I'm excited to begin this uh, series through the book of Acts. Uh, We'll trust that God will, will use it in our lives. But as we considered what we were going to preach on next, uh, discussing this with the, the other elders, you know, we've, we've noticed, well, it's not hard to notice, the fact that God has given us some, some growth lately, and it feels kind of like a new church in the last several months. And uh, it's kind of startling at times to think of, of the change. But Acts gives us a picture of, of the New Testament church beginning and uh, we thought it would be a good idea to, to give some focus to that part of Scripture that, that tells us of the beginning of the New Testament church. 
So, this morning we begin in Acts, and I want to invite you to take your Bible with me and turn to Acts chapter 1. Right at the beginning, if you're using the church Bible, 909 is where you'll find that. And uh, we'll read the first five verses, and we'll just leave it there for this morning. So, Acts chapter 1, 1 through 5, let's give our full attention to the truth of God's word. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This is God's word. We thank him for it. Would you bow with me and we'll pray together that God would use this time. Father, in that verse that we've been memorizing, we're, we're reminded that your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. And the power of your word, because, Father, you have spoken it in the same way that you declared the universe into existence, your word comes to our lives and accomplishes exactly what you intend it to do. And we pray that you would do that work this morning, in spite of the fact that this word is being proclaimed by a flawed man, as any preacher is flawed. So, God, what we need... What we depend on right now in this time is for you, by your spirit, to plant this word in our hearts and in our minds, cause it to take hold and to produce the fruit that you have determined that it should produce, our sanctification, our conformity to the image of your Son. We pray this, Father, that your Son, Jesus, our Savior and Lord, may be glorified. So we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, the title of this uh, book of the Bible, the Book of Acts, is really by tradition rather than inspiration. So the name of the, the book is an, an inspired title. Uh, it's primarily focused on the ministries of Peter and Paul. So, as it's called, the Acts of the Apostles, an alarming number of the other apostles are absent. We get, a, we get a, barely a, a mention of John three times and James only in as much as he is executed by Herod. So really, the acts of a few apostles is probably what this is about. But it, really, it's not even so much about the acts of the apostles. It'd probably be better titled, The Acts of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in history, the book has been called simply, The Acts. Or, The Gospel of the Holy Ghost. The Gospel of the Holy Ghost. Or, The Gospel of the Resurrection. Those are names that have been given to this book. Now, I think you know this. If you don't, this is really a continuation of uh, a work done by Luke. So uh, Luke, the gospel that bears his name, and Acts really together being, being one complete set, a two-volume set, if you will. Uh, this is the second part, and you can see that he is telling us, or telling this, this person, Theophilus, to whom he's written. Um, this is the second so he, he tried to deal with some other things in the other book. And so the beginning of Luke, you see, Theophilus is mentioned there as well. I don't know if there's any particular significance of who the addressee of this book is, Theophilus. The name means love of God or friend of God. Really little, known is, uh, little is known about him apart from this mentioned by Luke. It's possible, I suppose, that he, he uh, funded the work of this or provided some support to Luke to, to do this historical work. As for Luke, the... The book that bears, uh, or the, the author of the Gospel of Luke, and, and this one, of course. Um, possibly a Gentile convert of the Apostle Paul. That's not conclusive. But certainly, he is a skilled historian. And uh, even in the, um, the scholarly world, it is acknowledged that Luke, as a historian, in the, from the ancient writers, is really second to none. Now what we read here in these first five verses, really by Luke's own account, is a summary of his first book, that gospel that bears his name. 
This book, Acts, sits between the announcement of the gospel, that is the good news about Jesus Christ, and the explanation uh, and the application of the good news in the epistles. And it sits right in between the two. And I think you'd agree that as, as we read through this, this book of Acts, we see the birth of the New Testament church. However, verse 3 in the text that we just read tells us that after Jesus was crucified, after he was buried and raised, he appeared to his disciples over this period of 40 days. And what he spoke to them about was the kingdom of God. So from Luke's record, Jesus isn't saying anything about the church. Now I've titled my message, The Kingdom of God. Not that creative, it really comes right out of the scriptures. But my aim this morning is for us to consider the kingdom of God and what it has to do with the church. Sometimes these concepts get confused. State another way, to consider what the church has to do with the kingdom of God. And I would say this, I, I would say if we misunderstand the kingdom of God, we will misunderstand the nature and the mission of the church. Now I mentioned that the reason for focusing on, on the book of Acts is, is the fact that it feels new. Now there's much new growth among us. Uh, so with that said, what has been true for the early church is very true for us. Now Jesus spoke much about the kingdom of God in the Gospels. Now when we, in our own thinking about kingdom in this present day, in the modern age, we have a sense of history. The kingdom concept, I suppose at least in this part of the world, is a little foreign to our experience. We have this representative republic. Power to govern. <laughs> Power to govern is in our hands, right? Exercised by our votes. Well, not mine, I'm a Canadian. Your vote, if you're a citizen. You, you have that power. So the idea of kingdom in our minds, uh, it seems inadequate, perhaps. It seems like it doesn't really do the job because we, we look to other parts of the world and we see, well, it's not that great. Just this last week, uh, you saw in the news perhaps, um, it was the, uh, the king of Saudi Arabia, uh, King Abdullah died. His death really highlights what is true about many kingdoms. Brutally oppressive and corrupt. Those are in, in kingdoms where there's absolute uh, power. In other places in the world where there's kingdoms, we get the sense that they're impotent. Uh, they're really figureheads. So the example would be uh, the British or the former British Empire where there's Queen Elizabeth. And really, what does she do? Uh, I mean, she spends money and she hosts things, but really she has no real influence over policy. Uh, she has no real influence over the governance of, of the people that she is queen over. So we, we see them either as corrupt or impotent. And yet Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God, and this is something to be cherished, something to be held in high esteem. So we want to bring our thinking back to that. Now, of course, Jesus had much to say about the kingdom of God. Let me just review a few things that, that the gospel writers record that he had to say about the kingdom of God. Uh, certainly at the beginning of, of Mark, you must repent because this kingdom is at hand. Jesus taught as well that some will not enter the kingdom. Very ominous words. He said, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord. He'll say, depart from me. He told uh, them that the casting out of demons is evidence of the kingdom of God. Interesting. He also taught that growth in the kingdom of God is very much likened to a mustard seed that, that gets planted. It's tiny, tiny little seed, but it grows to be this huge, huge plant that birds nest in. He taught as well that the kingdom of God is so, so very valuable. Its worth is that, that in thinking about the kingdom of God, it would be worth it to sell everything that you had to get it. He taught as well, this is Jesus taught as well, that entrance into the kingdom of God required humility. Really a, a childlike faith. But we're also told that the, the kingdom of God welcomes repentant sinners of all kinds. But, alternatively, that the self-righteous have absolutely no place in the kingdom of God. Jesus taught as well, and this is in the Lord's Prayer, that we should pray for the kingdom of God to come. 
We're also told that if we seek the kingdom of God above all else, God will add to us the things that we're inclined to worry about, the things that we think we need, that God will take care of that if we keep our focus first and foremost on the kingdom of God. And then, of course, that the kingdom of God itself has everything to do with Jesus. You see, some had asked Jesus when the kingdom would come. He said, it's not over there or over here. And he spoke to them. He said, the kingdom is in the midst of you. Really referring to himself. You want to know about the kingdom? Jesus says, look to me. Now, I understand that we tend to be much more familiar with the concept of church than we do with the kingdom. But by contrast, those first century followers of Jesus, they were much more familiar with the kingdom of God than they were with what the church would look like. Of course, we read here of their experience as the birth of the New Testament church. So the kingdom of God, even to the disciples of Jesus in that first century, they had that concept, the, 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 the concept was familiar to them, but, but they needed their thinking aligned with God's purposes, and that would take some time. They knew the scriptures. They knew the heyday of, of the Israelite kingdom. They remembered back to the time of David, the time of Solomon. But they also knew the history, right? They knew what happened over time. They, they remembered how the, uh, the, the kingdom was divided under Rehoboam. Eventually that northern kingdom, centuries later, would fall to the Assyrians, be dispersed, never to be seen again. Then ultimately, not long after, the kingdom of Judah was taken captive by Babylon. And even though they were restored to their land, the temple and the walls rebuilt, as Bobby's been teaching in the Sunday school class, it had not really regained its former glory that they remembered under David and Solomon. It just wasn't the same. And as for the kingdom of God, and at least in their thinking, Peter and the apostles, they now lived under Roman domination. What would be this kingdom? What does this look like? It had to be radically redefined by Jesus. And for the church, as for the idea of the church, that's something that they would come to understand. So this morning, as we consider the kingdom of God in light of the birth of the New Testament church and where we fit as a New Testament church today, I want to gather some thoughts under three headings. And I've just simply taken these headings from the text. So there's an outline for you in the bulletin. But there's, there's really three things that I see here that, that provide the structure of what I want to uh, focus on this morning. First is the promise of the Father. That's later on in that section. The second is the proofs of the Son. This, I'm just taking this from the text. These aren't my headings. And the thirdly is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I, I don't really think it's any accident here that Luke is introducing this book as a record of God's work including Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Different persons of the Godhead united and unified in the work of bringing glory to the one God through salvation to a people that ultimately bear his name. So let's unpack this text this morning. Brief introductory remarks for what unfolds in the book of Acts. And uh, we'll see where this takes us. And trust that God will apply this to our hearts. My first heading is simply the kingdom of God. Well, this isn't in your notes, but this is my heading for this. The kingdom of God is assured by the promise of the Father. The kingdom of God is assured by the promise of the Father. Now, if you look down in verse 4, it says there, He ordered them, this is Jesus, not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. So what's the promise? Well, we, we, can, we can pick this up by reading from the text. It's the promise of the Holy Spirit. But it's the very thing that Luke already wrote about in his gospel. Luke 24, 49. I didn't provide any references. Like I said, a week of lethargy left me to the last minute on the outline. So here we go. Luke 24, 49 is that reference. And it says this. There's Jesus saying this. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. There, as Luke records and reminds us of here at the beginning of Acts, there Jesus is referring back to something else. So while we're referred back to Luke, we go back to Luke and we find that Jesus is in fact referring to a prior promise. So we want to look at that. What, what is he talking about? And I believe what he's focusing there on there is the, the promise through the prophet Joel. 
It says there in Joel 2, 28 through 29, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. Glorious thing that God had prepared to do even before Jesus spoke it. Jesus in declaring that the Holy Spirit would come. Jesus is saying this is based on the promise of the Father. Well, what was the purpose of that promise? Now, of course, we can look ahead and, and, and infer what that would be. But, but as we think about this in the context of Jesus speaking it to his disciples, referring back to Joel, what was Joel thinking about? Of course, God gave him the word to say, prophetically. But that promise of the Spirit was ultimately anchored in prior promises of God. When you see a promise of God in the scripture, it doesn't just stand alone as something brand new. So it looks like it's a new promise. But it's not a new idea. That's the important thing. God's, all of God's promises rest on prior promises. And really as we see these things come to light, they are the unfolding of his plan, which was set in place before the world was created. So from the beginning of time, God made promises. At the beginning of calling out a people, what did he do? He, he called out a people... For his own possession. A promise was made to Abraham. Go here. I'll tell you where that land is. Abraham believed God. Credited righteousness to him. Called him his own people. He said there's going to be all these descendants. You can't count them. Look at the stars. God made that promise that there would be a people. And then when that people finally was constituted. As he called them out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. He gives them, he comes to them in the wilderness wanderings. And what does he say to them? I will make my dwelling among you. This is, I'm sorry, Leviticus 26, 11 and 12. I will make my dwelling among you. And my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God. And you shall be my people. That's amazing. God said to his people, I'm going to walk among you. This is intimate. God desires to be personally involved with the lives of his people. Well, what did God do? What did God do? So that he could be personally involved in the lives of people? He said, here's a law. He already told them, you're going to be my people. I'll be your God. Then he said, here's a law. As if to say, the Ten Commandments. As if to say, this is what I'm like. You want to know what matters to me? Here, here's a list. Here's a basic list. That's the Ten Commandments. And then what did he do? He gave the tabernacle. Place that they could recognize that oh, God is among us. And then he gave the, the temple after David. Same thing. Our God is among us. Not like the other false gods of the world. They don't care. They're out there. They have to be appeased. No, our God walks among us. Then he gave that temple and the tabernacle to tell the people, here's how you draw near to me. This is the appropriate way to come to me. And then he gave his word. He'd already given his word, but he gave more words through prophets. And he reminded his people of his covenant, of his promises. But, of course, we know. They knew. God's people always wandered away. They were easily distracted. They were often disobedient. And this was not a surprise to God. And all of that took place so that the people of God would see the necessity of something beyond their best efforts to come to God. God was graciously displaying the immensity of his grace throughout the centuries and the millennia. And when the prophet Joel spoke of the day the Spirit of God would be poured out on the hearts of men, it was not something new. It would be the means by which the people of God could remain faithful to him. It would be the means by which the people of God would walk with God and God would walk among his people. So John, the gospel writer, records what Jesus says. He said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. So Jesus was present with his disciples and they followed him and they understood some of his teaching. They were perplexed by other things that he taught. But he said, look, I'm going to ask the Father. He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. From the very beginning when God said, you will be my people and I will be your God and I will walk among you. The Holy Spirit is the ultimate fulfillment of that promise that was anchored in the very mind of God before he created anything at all. So we see it from the beginning of time. God had it in mind to set apart a people for himself. He had it in mind to rule over them. Not as an angry, uh, capricious dictator, but a benevolent, sacrificing, giving, gracious king. And the kingdom of God is the rule of God. And by its very nature, this kingdom of God isn't something that we do. We don't create it. We don't establish it. We don't set it up. We don't give God his power to rule. He already owns it. It is his. We don't establish its borders. God does what he does in this kingdom by his grace. And by his grace, he includes us in it. Well, that's the promise of the Father. Secondly, I want you to notice uh, the kingdom of God is secured, is secured in the victory of the Son. Now, in this brief little section here, we're not told of all of the exchanging conversation between Jesus and his disciples. Uh, I often try to imagine what the disciples were thinking. I mean, if you read through it enough times, you think, well, not enough is said to really get a sense. I mean, I, I try to Think of how I would feel in that circumstance. After his crucifixion, there was sadness and, and, and disappointment, I'm sure. And, and then the resurrection, this, this, at the beginning, is it real? Is it true? It, did this really happen? But then seeing him alive and experiencing that joy. But really, remember, they're thinking, well, how does this whole kingdom of God thing work? Remember, they're thinking, and I didn't mention this earlier, but I've said this before, that as they're thinking, okay, we'll get rid of the Romans. Jesus, you're our king. We've got it. You, you, you'll establish it in the world. Jesus had to radically change their thinking about that. Yet it tells us, verse 3, He, Jesus, presented himself to them alive after suffering by many proofs. They needed to see him alive. It had to be, right? He had to leave no doubt in their minds that he was alive. They had seen the empty tomb. They one or two of them saw an angel who bore witness to the fact that Jesus was alive. He, he met a couple of them on the road to Emmaus where he taught them on that journey about himself from all of the scriptures. He ate with his disciples, stood among them, appeared in the room and then disappeared. Thomas touched his wounds, proclaimed, my Lord, my God. I'm sure that there were many, many more occasions that we do not have recorded. Because why? Paul tells us that there were 500 witnesses to Jesus being alive. The kingdom of God is ultimately secured in the victory of the Son. The victory of the Son in what? In conquering death. Death does not have to hold you. Death could not hold Jesus. And by faith in Him, we are released from that same penalty that same curse of creation that comes to us all. Yes, we will die physically if Jesus does not return, but we will not die eternally and we will ultimately live forever because Jesus is alive. Jesus said this in John chapter 16, verse 7. Anticipating what he was going through, what he was going to go through, his death and resurrection. He says this to them. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Now, if I was one of the disciples sitting there thinking, really, how does that help? I, I'm not so sure. It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Now, Jesus' words here are very interesting. And again, I know I'm putting a lot in this little text here. I don't think I'm imposing on it, but I'm trying to unpack the kinds of things that he's speaking about and what, what is behind it, right? So what does Jesus mean? Why, I take it that it would be impossible, impossible for the Holy Spirit to be poured out unless Jesus went away. The Holy Spirit could not be poured out on those 
who would be left in their sin. The Holy Spirit could not be poured out on those who are far from God, who are destined for, for the wrath of God. Now, how is this accomplished? Of course, you know the gospel. If you don't, I'll remind you of it. And it's, it's summed up in the Apostle Paul's declaration of this glorious exchange that happened at the cross. It says there in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake, he, that is Jesus, or sorry, he, that is God the Father, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin. For our sake, I'll read it again, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This glorious exchange that happened at the cross where our sin and unrighteousness was imputed to Christ as he suffered the curse of God, ultimately dying, and his perfect righteousness imputed back to all who would put their faith in him. Only those who had the imputed righteousness of Christ could be those upon whom the Holy Spirit would be poured out. So, it means a great deal that Jesus was crucified and made alive. The truthfulness of Jesus' words were proved to the disciples as he proved to him, proved to them, here I am. That Jesus said who he, that Jesus was who he said he was. That Jesus' resurrection was a real deal. And an essential part of this proclamation going forward for the, the resurrection of Christ. The whole, the whole project would be useless. The whole, the whole faith declaration in God would accomplish nothing at all. The Apostle Paul reminds us later in 1 Corinthians, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. He proved he was God. He propitiated the wrath of God. Jesus secured the kingdom of God by his death and resurrection and made it even possible for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. Well, the third heading is simply this, and this will be far more brief. The kingdom of God advances by the power of the Spirit. By the power of the Spirit. Now, I think I already alluded to this, that the kingdom of God and the church, the concepts often get confused in this day and age. It has happened throughout history. People in the church have said, how do we grow this thing? How do we advance the kingdom of God? And the church has botched it badly. You know from history, right? The Crusades and the High and the Early Middle Ages seeking to capture Jerusalem. We're building the kingdom of God. We've got to get Jerusalem back. Much blood was shed over a false notion of the kingdom of God. So the church thought they were in the business of building God's kingdom on earth. And all they did was bring ill repute to the cause of Christ. See, what was happening then is that popes and kings, they depended on military might. And they entirely missed the plan of God for the kingdom of God. Verse 5, it tells us here in our text, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus is talking about the power for the kingdom of God. It does not rest in the church. It does not rest with individuals, but rests, in fact, with the Holy Spirit. Now he's telling them, why does he bring John into this? Well, first of all, the idea of baptism means to dip or immerse. So he's saying, you're going to be immersed with the Holy Spirit. So why the reference to John? You might ask that question. Well, John himself differentiated his own ministry from the ministry of Jesus. When John was baptizing in the Jordan for the repentance of sins, people were coming to him because they felt bad for their sins. They recognized that before God they needed repentance. So their baptism was a symbolic act of washing away sin. But it didn't save them. It was symbolic of something greater. He said, look, I'm baptizing you with water. But one is coming after me. This is Luke 3. I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming. The strap of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Well, we think about this. And this is just a brief point. But what happens because of the Holy Spirit? Now I'm saying, the Holy Spirit is the power for advancing the kingdom of God. It advances by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we know this practically. And personally, don't we? Why did you turn to Christ in repentance and faith? 
wasn't because you were clever. <laughs> Why do churches get established? Because we're somehow, we figured this out. We, 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 we know the formula. Why is it any good thing in the world happens for the cause of Christ and the proclamation of the gospel and the gathering together of the people of God? It's because the Holy Spirit. You are not in the faith this morning apart from the Holy Spirit. This church doesn't exist apart from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the power for the kingdom of God. Now, I've still got these two concepts a little bit separated, don't I? We've got the kingdom of God. And we've got the church. So what are we as the church supposed to do about the kingdom of God? Do we build it? Can we advance it? Can we strengthen it? Can we bring it to bear on the earth? Now, like I said, there's much confusion about this. Even today, in as much as they got it wrong during the time of the Crusades, people still get it wrong today. If we can only alleviate hunger in our community, we'll bring the kingdom of God. If we can only eliminate violence in families, we can bring the kingdom of God. If we could only get more hospitals, and I'm not against these things, believe me, it's a good citizen who takes his Christian principles and says, we've got to fix this thing. But we're not bringing the kingdom of God because we wipe out abortion. What do we have to do with the kingdom of God? Well, here's some practical things. This is in conclusion, so I'm wrapping up here. First of all, we receive it. We receive it. Hebrews 12, 28, 29 says this, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's not a human thing. It cannot be shaken. This isn't something that we can do or protect or... No. We receive the kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship. What do we do in response? We receive it. And we express worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. He doesn't need our help to build his kingdom. He determined to do it from the beginning of time and he's continuing to do that today. So, having received it, what do you do? Express your gratitude. God, thank you for including me in your kingdom. And it enlivens our worship, doesn't it? I see what you're doing, God. You brought us into your kingdom. You brought me into your kingdom. So we receive it and we worship and we're grateful for it. Well, secondly, what else should we do? We should enjoy it. Enjoy the kingdom of God. Here and now. Yes, it's not complete, but we can enjoy it now. The, the Apostle Paul says in Romans 14, 16, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but what? Of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. That's what we have. Enjoy it. And listen, brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't this what enlivens our fellowship? When we gather together, speaking of all of that Christ has accomplished in our lives individually and among us as a church, sharing our burdens, acknowledging that God has to intervene in our lives, acknowledging the power of the Spirit to, to conform us to the image of Christ, when we share in accountability with one another, hey, help me continue to read through the Scriptures. We're not doing that just so we can check some boxes. We're doing that because we benefit from the Word of God and the Holy Spirit takes these things and the joy that comes from our salvation that's planted in us because the kingdom that we belong to it enriches us, strengthens us, and helps us to walk in another day. So we enjoy it. Thirdly, we look forward to its complete dominion. Now understand this. There's the kingdom of God and there's this present age. We look around. We think, well, God, are you really reigning over there? Are you really reigning in our government? That may be a question. God's kingdom, we're to pray that it will come. God's kingdom, I assure you, is advancing because we have received it and we're part of it, right? But there's coming a day when it will be complete and the authority of Jesus will be recognized universe-wide and no one will doubt anymore with the writer of Philippians, the Apostle Paul, we, we look forward to that day. It says there, God has highly exalted him, that is Jesus, and bestowed on him a name, the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the full dominion of the kingdom of God, and we sang about that this morning, and we look forward to it. 
But between now and then, the kingdom of God has been announced by God. It's something that He's doing. What do we as a church do? Or our job, our mission, this is how this relates ultimately. Our job is to announce it. And that sounds pretty simple. We simply announce the kingdom. We're not building the kingdom of God. That's God's doing. He is the, the author of the kingdom. He assured it from the beginning of time. He said, I'm pulling apart a people, pulling together a people. I'm separating them from the world. They are mine. I will walk with them. I'll dwell with them. I will be their God. They will be my people. And we get the benefit of that. That's God's doing. What are we to do as a church? We announce the kingdom. How do we announce the kingdom? By proclaiming the gospel. And it's that simple. That's what we're going to see through the book of Acts. They're not building the kingdom. They're announcing the kingdom. Because they've received the kingdom. So in this time while we wait for the return of Christ, this present evil age is losing its grip on the people that God has determined to save. And slowly and surely over time, God is taking back territory. And we as individual believers, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.20, what are we? We're ambassadors of the king. We plead with people, be reconciled to God. We announce the, the ownership of everything to Jesus our king through the proclamation of the gospel. We're declaring Jesus is king. Get on side. Believe him. But that's the fact. And slowly but surely, as the Holy Spirit empowers our witness, more and more people will come into the sphere to the ownership of King Jesus. Until he's determined that every last one of the people he has wanted to save is part of his kingdom. And then Christ will return. So in the meantime, we function as individual ambassadors and we gather together in this little outpost of the kingdom of God, an ambassadorial outpost, ready to meet together and to strategize how we might tell more people, to remind each other of the kingdom of God that we're part of, to remind each other about the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to tell it to one another, to encourage each other in it, and to find ways to tell it to more people. Because frankly, we're not going to build anything apart from the power of the Holy Spirit, who by the proclamation of the gospel will bring people into the sphere of the rule of God, the kingdom of God. We're part of it. It is our privilege. It is our mission to declare Christ. And I pray that we will fully embrace that role. Acts will tell us how that looked in the first church. And we will be able to pattern much after them. Well, kind of an awkward place to end. But next week we'll get into some very specific teachings of Jesus and what he's declaring will be for the church. But for now, for now, let's revel in the fact that God has included us in his kingdom and that God is a God who walks among us. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the Holy Spirit and we thank you that you, Father, had determined to do this from the beginning of time. We recognize, Lord, that we are powerless, that all of the power that we might have for the things that you've called us to do rests in you and in your spirit. So make us people who are delighted to belong to you, to be the people of God. Make us people, Father, who look forward to the return of Christ. Cause our fellowship to be uh, sweetened and strengthened by this knowledge. And cause it to be for each of us that we are delighted and excited to declare the kingship of the Lord Jesus among those who do not yet believe so that they may turn to him in repentance and faith and enjoy the benefits of your kingdom, Father. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Well, again, if you are able to stand, would you join us and we will close our time by singing our anthem. I have not done no list of virtues I pursue no list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you oh God be merciful
merciful to me. I am a sinner through and through. My only hope of righteousness is not in me. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.